all things are a loss compared to just knowing Christ Jesus. The, the presence of God is all that matters. It's all that matters. And in our relationship with the Lord, we have a lot of expectations. And I think often we don't realize we carry those expectations until they don't get met. And this happens a lot. Uh, we get into a difficult circumstance and we're like, Lord, please show up and deal with this. And then he doesn't. Or um, he'll deal with it with somebody one way, but he deals with it with us another way. And it's really hard. And, and we're like, God, this isn't fair. And why are you doing this? Da, da, da. Like we really struggle to be okay with a God who when we pray, he doesn't do what we want him to do. But that's the very defining moment of who we believe God actually is. Because for many of us, we're like, God, I'll follow you as long as you do what I expect you to do. And, and we've all visited that place. Let's be honest. We've all at least vacationed there. We may not live there, but we've at least vacationed there. Even in my own life, I could point to examples where I'm like, God, I prayed for this thing and it was a good thing and I felt like you were gonna do it and then you didn't and now what? What do I do with that? That is a way to view, and I see a lot of people who walk away from the Lord because they're like, I prayed and God didn't show up and do what I wanted him to do and now I'm out. Super transactional relationship. That's not the kind of relationship God is after. God wants us to be consumed in his presence. He wants us to be consumed in just being with him. Hello, family. So good to see you all. Uh, thanks for coming today. Uh, thanks for joining us online as well. I, I want to um, just mention one thing, and it, it's, it'll tie into why we're talking about what we're talking about today. Um, I, over the last 31 years I've been in ministry, that's a long time, it's three decades of just doing one thing, and it's been a, kind of a pursuit of mine to figure out like human purpose and like each individual purpose, each individual's purpose before God. What did God put you here for? And um, the good thing is God has been really generous to me in helping that become really, really crystal clear for me. Um, I know exactly why God put me on this earth. Now, whether I like that or not is sometimes a different story, but um, I know exactly why God put me on this earth. And um, that purpose is to call the church back to what God intended her to be biblically. Um, and that's really important for me because there's a lot of people that are like, well, you should preach more about this or say that more, have more, whatever, altar calls, whatever, 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 whatever. Um, and I know that probably when you think about pastor, there's ideas that come to mind who they are and who they're not. And some of that's positive and some of that's probably not so positive and probably all that's earned at some level. Um, I just, uh, I just want to be clear that um, nobody with any ill intent has said you should do, you should say this more. The, the people are like, I'm, I'm particularly passionate about this thing and, and you don't talk about it much. I'm like, yeah, but this is what God made me for. This is why God put me here. And I don't ever have to deviate from that. That's so freeing. Like, I, I pray that for you, that you can stand in that space. It's so freeing to know why God put you on this earth. And that's not a mystery, by the way. You can figure it out. Um, so that being said, uh, as we talk today, my heart in this sermon isn't for you and I to think about somebody else that should hear this message or to think about how the culture is letting us down in these regards. This, my hope for this sermon is that as we listen and as Holy Spirit works in our hearts to do whatever he's going to do, that we would be able to stand in the mirror of our soul and be honest about where we're actually at. That's my prayer for each of us. Me too. Uh, and the thing about these sermons is I am made miserable by them long before you are. <laughs> so I just want to commiserate 
with you uh, in this regard. Today, what we're going to talk about, we're in this series called Restoration, and the desire is to call the church back to see what we can do. We're going to talk about um, empire versus kingdom. And this is an epic struggle in the, in the Bible of who's building what. Uh, are, are we building an empire or are we building God's kingdom? This, and, and the empire is always ruled by a king and the kingdom is always ruled by a shepherd. You think Moses, shepherd. Think David, shepherd. These, here's the interesting thing. These juxtapositions in the scripture of Pharaoh and Moses, Saul and David, God always sides with the shepherd. His desire is always to build his kingdom, not our personal empires. And what that means is that we've got to be willing to sift what's going on in us. Because it's, it's, uh, it's subtle. Um, so I want to begin this morning with uh, Matthew chapter 20. And we're going to read a passage. And I, th- I think I would invite you to put yourself in the position of the, um, the other 10 apostles in this. Like, how would you respond <laughs> to this? But here's what it says. The mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons. Now, I have a jillion questions in that half sentence. Um, First of all, why don't we get to know her name, but we get to know Zebedee's name, who's not even there? Why, the only one who's not there is the one that gets mentioned. Like, that that feels wrong to me. And and are, are we picking out Zebedee's name because he's the reason why this whole thing happened? Is he done something wrong to, like, I feel like he's being unfairly fingered in this scenario. They're like, they're, I just have a lot of questions. What's going on here? Um, but we know that the sons of Zebedee are James and John, right? And their mom drags them. And I just, just imagine this little Yiddish woman bringing her boys up. Um, and she comes up to Jesus and kneels before him uh, she asked him for something. Jesus said to her, what do you want? <laughs> I don't know if that was the tone in his voice. I don't know. Um, but I know it was the tone in his heart. Like, uh, no, it wasn't. Um, it wasn't. Like, he's, what, what do you want? Um, what do you want? What do you want? She said to him, there's not even a question here. It's like a demand. Say that these two sons of mine are to sit at one one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. Say it. Say it. Now, she is certainly thinking at this point still of a physical kingdom. The goal here, their understanding of kingdom is that Jesus is going to overthrow Rome and there's going to be an earthly kingdom. And when he's on his throne, she wants her boys to sit one on his right side and one on his left side. Now, They're part of the 12, so that's kind of a big deal. But they're even part of the inner three, so that's also a big deal. However, um, this feels like a presumptuous question. Jesus answered, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? Now, what this seems to allude to is that for Jesus, in the kingdom of God, reward is tied to suffering. We work so hard to avoid suffering, to make our lives comfortable, to make our lives easy, to make our lives bubble wrapped so that we don't get hurtsies. I would just offer that you can have comfort or you can have Jesus, but you can't have them both they kind of work against one another. And they said to him, we're able, like a couple of teenage boys would. Yeah, I can do anything. And for the record, by the way, Peter is probably the only one of the 12 that's older than 20. Um, That's another sermon for another day. But the rest of these guys are teenage boys, which raises this question How in the world do you entrust the most important message in history to teenage boys? I'm just thrilled. I mean, when my boys were teenagers, I was like, oh, you got out of bed. Today's a win. I mean, yeah, you're half an hour late. We'll we'll let them know. I feel like we're headed in the right direction here. 
I know my boys are amazing, but like, the, really, like that feels like a big thing to put on these boys. But they, they're like, yeah, we can do it. We'll do whatever. We're invincible. He said to them, you will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and my left hand is not mine to grant, but it is for those whom it has been prepared by my father which I, I would love to preach a whole sermon on that. And someday we probably will preach a sermon on actual like suffering and the issue of pain in the world. Um, and, w- and when the 10 heard it, and this is you guys, remember, you're supposed to put yourself in the position of these guys. When the 10 heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. Yup. What, like, who do you think you are? You're special and we're not. Like, why would you even ask this question? But Jesus called them to him and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. This is Jesus' call. This is authority in the kingdom. Authority isn't used to keep people under your thumb. Authority is used to empower and leverage people to set them free. Authority is used to give it away. And what's interesting is it feels, authority often feels like a fixed sum uh, proposition. Like there's only so much of it to go around. So when I give you some, I actually diminish my own. So we have a tendency to hoard it. No, I have all the, the authority. Look at how important I am. It actually works the opposite in the kingdom. The more that we give away, the more authority we actually possess. That's what's interesting. The more that we empower and release and encourage and inspire people around us, the more that people want us to be in charge. It's weird. They don't want people in charge that are gonna lord it over them. Uh, Even as the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So this is the beginning conversation. When when we're building our own empire, it looks a certain way. The, The rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. When we're building the kingdom, it also looks a certain way. We must become the servant of everybody. And this is how the kingdom works. And so what I want to wrestle with today for the rest of our time together is how do we know that in our lives we're building the kingdom and not just our own empire? Because this, it's a subtle trap to start living as if building my world and building God's world are the same thing. I got to stop working from the premise that I can build my world and God's world at the same time. We build God's world or God's not a part of the picture. God doesn't share second place. He doesn't share his his throne. How do we make sure that we're building God's kingdom and not our own empire? Well, I'm going to give you three kind of prepositional truths that I would like for you to wrestle with throughout the week uh, as we do this. And, and again, this has, been, uh, this has been a stirring in my own heart. And for the record, it's where I believe God has our church, that we are in this space of being honest about repentance and about mining the idols out of our hearts. And it's so that we're prepared as, as he um, reveals more of his presence to us. And I want that. Listen, here's the thing. If, if there's more of God's presence to be had, I want to wring out every drop. Because what else matters? Like we can get caught up in all the, all the stuff, but nothing else matters. This is our first premise, is that God's presence is all that matters. God's presence is the only thing that matters. And we get caught up in, in, in our lives, in the church. We get caught up getting all worked up about things that don't matter. Like we want to be right, but we don't want to be godly. We treat our walk with the Lord as if moral correctness is the goal. Um, moral correctness is not the goal of Christianity. Moral correctness is a side benefit of being transformed by God. 
the goal of Christianity is God's presence more and more and more in my life. And we get, we get kind of worked up about that. Like we, we, we get all shook in the wrong direction because we're not keeping our eye on the most important things. In Philippians 3, Paul says this. This is probably as close to a life verse as I have. Um, people ask me a lot, like, what, you know, do you have a life verse? I'm like, I, I love the Bible. Like, all of it is really great. Every word, every letter, every space between the letters dripping with the presence of God in it. How do you pick a favorite? I mean, let's be honest. Leviticus, probably not going to be a place where we pour over, you know, numbers. I was in my, I was in my devotional time the other day and, and God put in, on my heart to read n- in numbers. And I was like, I know that's the Lord. Cause I would never pick that one on my own. <laughs> um, I was like, thank you, Lord. I don't know what, I don't know what treat you have in store for me in this passage, but I know I wouldn't have come up with it. So Philippians three is a really important passage, seven to 11. It's a really important passage to me. Here's what it says. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Just that I would know him is more important than anything else I've achieved. That's what Paul says. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things. Here's what's interesting about the phrase all things here. In the Greek, it it literally translates all things. Which is like, duh. Um, But that's actually significant. That's not an overstatement of the word. It actually means I've lost everything. I think for most of us, we would say, yeah, we've given up a lot to be with Jesus. We've made choices that we didn't necessarily want to make. We've lived a lifestyle that we didn't necessarily always want to uphold. But the fact is, we've done that. But here's what Paul says. It's not just some things. Everything. I, I, for his sake, I've suffered the loss of everything. And count them as rubbish. The most vanilla translation in the entire Bible, the word rubbish. Um, I leave that for you to go and learn the meaning of this. Um, fascinating word. In order that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings. And this seems to be part and parcel with walking with Jesus. Is that when we walk with him, we're going to hurt. And we work so hard to spiritually bubble wrap ourselves. But the fact is, and you're going to hear me say this a lot. I'm going to keep saying it. God never promises to deliver us from hard things. He promises to use our hard things to deliver us from the idols in our heart. So the, circ- the circumstances, regardless of where we find ourselves, this is why God, Romans 8.28 is actually a really good verse if you don't 8.28 somebody. Um, but like, we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and are called. To- it doesn't say that all things are good. It says that all things work for good. How do they work for good? Well, they work for good because they drive the idols out of our hearts. And that's worthy because God doesn't need to compete with anything in my life. Becoming like him in his death that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. I love this. All things are a loss compared to just knowing Christ Jesus. The the presence of God is all that matters. It's all that matters. And in our relationship with the Lord, we have a lot of expectations. And I think often we don't realize we carry those expectations until they don't get met. And and this happens a lot. Uh, We get into a difficult circumstance and we're like, Lord, please show up and deal with this. And then he doesn't, or um, he'll deal with it with somebody one way, but he deals with it with us another way. And it's really hard. And and we're like, God, this isn't fair. And why are you doing this? Like 
we really struggle to be okay with a God who, when we pray, he doesn't do what we want him to do. But that's the very defining moment of who we believe God actually is. Because for many of us, we're like, God, I'll follow you as long as you do what I expect you to do. And and we've all visited that place. Let's be honest. We've all at least vacationed there. We may not live there, but we've at least vacationed there. Even in my own life, I could point to examples where I'm like, God, I prayed for this thing and it was a good thing and I felt like you were gonna do it and then you didn't and now what? What do I do with that? That is a way to view, and I see a lot of people who walk away from the Lord because they're like, I prayed and God didn't show up and do what I wanted him to do and now I'm out. Super transactional relationship. That's not the kind of relationship God is after. God wants us to be consumed in his presence. He wants us to be consumed in just being with him. Uh, This, God is doing this even in my own life. I'm frustrated with him about it actually. He's like, Aaron, I'm taking the church someplace really incredible and I'm like, God, give me a picture so that I can know when distractions come, so that I can lead well. And God's like, no, I'm not giving you a picture. You don't need a picture. You need my presence. I I think so many times, you have a job decision to make. Do I move? Do I stay? Do I take this job? Do I take this job? Do, what am I doing with my life? What, what's going on? We, we have so many things that we wrestle with and, and often we're like, God, what do we do? And God's like, I'm not, that's not the point. The decision you make isn't the point. The point is, are you pressing into your relationship with me? I'll take care of all the details. And it's so f- frustrating to me that if I just hang out with God, all the stuff that I was so worried about gets done. I'm like, God, I, had a, I just needed a great strategy. He's like, no, you don't. You need my presence. You need my presence. My, God's presence is all that matters. So if you're building your empire, it's like, God, I, I know your presence matters and I kind of want this. I want it to look a certain way. I want it to achieve a certain thing. Whatever it is, that's, that's how God is supposed to function in our life. If we're building God's kingdom, then I give everything up because his presence is all that matters. Number two, if I'm building God's kingdom, then God's kingdom is my sole allegiance. And this is actually really significant for us to wrestle with. Um, One of the things that's written over and over again about the early Christians, so after the Bible is done, during the time of the early church, so we're talking in like the the late 100s, 200s, and 300s, these, these Christians, these Jesus followers, are being put to death. And the Roman historians are saying over and over again that they don't want to put them to death because they are Rome's finest citizens. But the irony of that is the reason why they're being put to death is that they say, we're not citizens of Rome. We're citizens of the kingdom of God. But that frees us up to be the best citizens wherever we are, whether that's the United States or Russia or North Korea or wherever we're at in the world, we are the best citizens because we belong, our our residency isn't here. And so the reason why we do what we do is different. The reason why we do what we do isn't to make a certain country better or worse, it's because it honors the king, the king of our hearts. Who's the kingdom? It's in the kingdom of God. That matters. Why we do what we do matters. So if you're going to be building God's kingdom and not your own empire, then God's kingdom must be our sole allegiance. Here's what Matthew 6 says. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Now the word money, 
So the, the actual word there is mammon, and um, it includes money, but it's not just having a money. It's, you can't serve money as a means to prop yourself up. That's the idea of mammon, or it really any, any possession, anything that we would leverage our stuff to prop ourselves up. That's what mammon is. It's this desire to make ourselves look a certain way based on the possessions that we have. If that's what you're chasing, if that's what you're trying to come across as, then you're not, you can't serve God. And if you're serving God, then you can't worry about the stuff. That's just the way it is. And so we wrestle with that because we get worried about things. That's why he says, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. Okay, Jesus, too late. <laughs> what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? And which of you by being anxious can add a single hour to a span of life? The answer to that is no. And in fact, I would offer that when you worry, you take away life. Like you're actually killing yourself by worrying. But spiritually speaking, worry is practical atheism. Let that one sit. Worry is practical atheism. But the only reason that I would ever worry is because I don't believe that God's got things in control. So now I'm concerned about how things are going to turn out. If I'm completely invested into the presence of God, I don't have to worry about that. I don't have to worry about that because I know who God is. And why are you anxious about clothing? <laughs> I have, over the years, and it's happened here too, people have um, made all kinds of comments about my clothes. <laughs> I had somebody tell me one time that they said I looked like I was going to a duck hunt. <laughs> okay, first of all, you've obviously never hunted ducks <laughs> because this is not what you would wear. And secondly, what if I was? Why would you feel like you needed to comment about what I was wearing? Furthermore, if you feel the freedom to talk about what I'm wearing, <laughs> polyester leisure suit is not a good option. Um, it, it's this weird, like people get cooked up about all the silly things. And furthermore, I'm like, okay, if your mind is so consumed in that space, where are you at with the Lord? Like, do you, do you care about what God cares about at all? Or are you leveraging God just to get what you want in life? Like how, because how can you spend time in the presence of the creator of the universe and care about stuff that's so trivial? I just don't understand it. I just don't understand it. Jesus goes on to say this, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Like, don't worry about stuff. Press into God's presence, seek first his kingdom, give your allegiance there, and then let God take care of the details. By the way, that's not passive. It's not lazy. 
It's not a lazy space. It's like, well, you're saying people don't have to work. No, the Bible also says if a person won't work, don't let them eat. Now, it doesn't say if a person can't work, don't let them eat. That's a different conversation. But it does say if a person won't work. They're capable of working. They just choose to be lazy. That's, that's not God's pursuit for us either. But we get so worked up about things that don't matter because we give pieces of our allegiance to things that aren't the kingdom of God. And it's so destructive. It's destructive in our own souls. Here's the third truth that I think we need to measure, we need to wrestle through to decide if we're building our own empire, if we're building God's kingdom. God's created design for the world is more important than how I think things should go. Here's the thing. God created the world and, and then he put boundaries and rules in it so that it would function a certain kind of way. And then he puts us in the world to live consistent with his created order. What we often do is we read the Bible and go, well, this is a thing that I don't like. I don't want to have to honor that. So I'm not going to because it's an ancient book. And the, no, the, the book is still consistent with God's created order. Like regardless of where we find ourselves, our goal is to live consistent with how God designed the world to function. And that's going to cause all of us to lay down some things that we really, really want. But we allow our desires because we live in a culture that's like, listen, if you desire it, you should have it. That's our world we live in. And unfortunately, we're wealthy enough as a culture to have the ability to go get it. Like we don't, we, we, we wrestle with whether or not we can have something, but we don't ever wrestle with whether or not we should. And, and so it winds up being this, this counterintuitive, and there's whole doctrines around like God inviting us. If you know you're blessed by God because you have all these things that you want. Mm, I, don't, I don't think that's biblical at all. If that's biblical, then the apostles who all one by one by one got butchered for their faith, those guys got wronged by God. Only, only in a wealthy space would we assume that we can leverage God to get more stuff. That's not how God, cre God created the world to design on the premise of generosity, not accumulation. Th I mean, think about it. All of creation functions on this premise of generosity. Fruit trees give us fruit. They don't go, well, you owe me. You don't even have to water them. The rains do that. They just give to you, right? This is how the world is designed to function. So when we function stingy, then we'd function inconsistent with how God created the world to function. We're building our own empire. We're not building God's kingdom. And here's the problem. Is that when we do that, generationally, people pay a price. Now, in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 14, do we get that fixed? And the, uh, there was a typo in the slides that said chapter four. It's not chapter four, it's chapter 14. I think we got it fixed. Um, but in Ezekiel 14, here's what's happening. God came to Ezekiel and said, Ezekiel, I want you to go out throughout the whole land and I want you to um, tear all the high places down to all the pagan gods. And so they do. And, and they, he and the elders and the chief priests, they, they go into this process of tearing down all these idols. But God still won't bless them. And in chapter 14 and verse one, here's what it says. Then certain of the elders of Israel came to me and sat before me. Now hear me say this. These are not people who don't understand how things are supposed to work. These are people who are not only mature in like years and experience, these are people who are um, supposed to be mature in their understanding of God's word and their understanding of how things function, of how God intended for us to function as his followers, all of it. These are the elders of Israel. These aren't just a bunch of knuckleheads. He's a knucklehead. Um, it's not them. These are the mature people. And they came to me and sat before me, and the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, these men have taken their idols into their hearts. And that's an issue. And set the stumbling block of their iniquity before their faces. 
what they're trying to do is to have God and these other things that they want. Should I indeed let myself be consulted by them? Therefore, speak to them and say to them, thus says the Lord God, any one of the house of Israel who takes his idols into his heart and sets a stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and yet comes to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him as he comes with the multitude of his idols. Like, whoa, whoa. The, what, Ezekiel, what God through Ezekiel is accusing the elders of Israel of doing is coming to try to worship God with other idols. Ooh, that's bad news. Like, we, we would never do that. I think we do that. And I think that's part of why we struggle to experience God because we want to have God and hold on to our idols. God will not share his glory. That I may lay hold of the hearts of the house of Israel who are all estranged from me through their idols. Therefore says, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, repent and turn away from your idols and turn away your faces from all of your abominations. By the way, idolatry in the Bible is compared to the sin of adultery. Like that's the level at which God sees this as a problem. This isn't like a, idolatry is like when you stub your toe and you let a little swear word slip. Fiddlesticks. This is like, one of the more profound, egregious things that you can do in this world. That's what idolatry is to God. He's not kidding about this. For any one of the house of Israel or of the strangers who sojourn in Israel, who separates himself from me, taking his idols into his heart and putting the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and yet comes to a prophet to consult me through him. Like, <laughs> You want to have all your idols, but when you need something from me, you want to come talk to me through a prophet. That's not how this works. You're trying to leverage me to build your own empire at that point. That's what God's saying. I, the Lord, will answer him myself, and I will set my face against that man. I will make him a sign and a byword and cut him off from the midst of my people, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Which, by the way, is like, wow, gosh, it feels really harsh. God, why are you being so harsh? Here's why, because God's not playing with this. And I think that in the church, we had too often get caught up in leveraging grace to be lazy about honoring God's holiness. And that's a problem. And if the prophet is deceived and speaks a word, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet and I will stretch out my hand against him and will destroy him from the midst of my people Israel. And they shall bear their punishment. The punishment of the prophet and the punishment of the inquirer shall be alike. Take the house, that the house of Israel may no more go astray from me nor defile themselves anymore with all their transgressions, but that they may be my people and I may be their God declares the Lord. This is God's desire. The reason why we mine out the idols in our hearts is because God wants to be near us. And remember, we talked about this last week. The problem with God's nearness is not how much he loves us. It's his holiness. If we're not prepared for it, it will destroy us. So we mine the idols out of our heart so that we can be near God. God loves us too much to destroy us because of our lack of preparation. That's the beauty and the curse of free moral agency. Here's another passage that's really interesting, and this one haunts me a little bit. 2 Kings chapter 17. It says, but every nation still made gods of its own and put them in the shrines of the high places that the Samaritans had made and every nation in the cities in which they lived. Here's some fun little names. The men of Babylon made Sukkot Benot. The men of Kuth made Nergal. The men of Hamath made Ashima. And the Avites made Nibhaz and Tartak. I practiced these this morning, actually. 
The Sarevites, excuse me, Sepharvites, burned their children in the fire of a, to Adramalek and, and Anamalek, the gods of Sepharvaim. But they were burning their children? Now, before you go crazy, these are the people who were also worshiping God, the God of the Bible. And to the other gods, they're sacrificing their children. You're like, how could they do that? I watch parents do it with sports all the time. But my kid has to get a college scholarship. Or what? Your kid needs to know how, who God is and how much he loves them. That's what they need to know. Because I promise you, when life falls apart for them, and it will, basketball or football or soccer is not going to carry them through. Wrestling might, but you know, that's... <laughs> maybe a personal bias. Here's what it says. So they're sacrificing their babies. They also feared the Lord and appointed from among themselves all sorts of people as priests of the high places who sacrificed for them in the shrines of the high places. So they're, they're making sacrifices to God at the same time that they're burning their children to other gods. So they feared the Lord but also served their own gods after the manner of the nations from among whom they had been carried away. To this day, they do according to the former manner. They do not fear the Lord and they do not follow the statutes or the rules or the law or the commandment that the Lord commanded the children of Jacob whom he named Israel. The Lord made a covenant with them and commanded them, you shall not fear other gods or bow yourselves to them or serve them or sacrifice to them, but you shall fear the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt with great power and with an outstretched arm. You shall bow yourselves to him and to him you shall sacrifice. And the statutes and the rules and the law and the commandment that he wrote for you, you shall always be careful to do. You shall not fear other gods and you shall not forget the covenant that I've made with you. You shall not fear other gods, but you shall fear the Lord your God and he will deliver you out of the hand of all your enemies. However, they would not listen. But they did according to their former manner. So these nations feared the Lord and also served their carved images. They weren't anti-God. In fact, I would say that they would even call themselves followers of God, maybe even Christian, but they're at a maximum, they're cultural Christians. But yeah, God, yeah, he's important. You know what else is important? Football. You know what else is important? Money. You know what else is important? Whatever it is, whatever the idol is in my heart, security, comfort, predictability. You know what, whatever, whatever my idol is, by the way, I got a list of them for myself. So I'm, I wrote this sermon like a month or so ago. So I've been miserable with it for a month. So now it's your turn. <laughs> I'm going to mess up your quiet times with the Lord this week. So they feared the Lord and also served their carved images. Their children did likewise and their children's children. As their fathers did, so they do to this day. Here's the problem. When we don't take our relationship with the Lord seriously, the next generation is the ones that pay the hardest price for it. And that's not okay. We're setting them up to fail because we want Jesus and. We're building our own empire. We're not building God's kingdom. And here's the thing. If you're like, yeah, I'm building God's kingdom, but I'm also, no, you're not building God's kingdom at all if that's your posture. Be clear about it. And here's the thing, you're free to choose whichever one you want to build. You're free to choose. You just can't say you're doing them both because you're not. You, you don't have to call yourself a follower of Jesus. You're free to choose whichever one you want. But if you're going to call yourself a follower of Jesus, that comes with a certain list of priorities. And if you're not willing to uphold those, 
This is why one of the, one of the fundamental 10 commandments is don't take the Lord's name in vain. The, I always explain it this way, but it's the simplest way I know to understand what that verse actually means. When, when you give your life to Jesus, he doesn't give you a t-shirt. He gives you his name. Don't take it in vain. Don't take his name without understanding the rules and obligations that come with it. Because when you do that, you live a life far worse than picking one side or the other. I have some implications for us. Implication number one. By the way, we're gonna start passing out communion now. Are, are you guys so excited about that? <laughs> we have about 150 people that are stepping up now to go get the communion. Remember the video, remember how to do it. While, while they're passing that out, we're gonna work through some implications uh, today. Implication number one is this. By the way, I have five implications. Yeah, if my wife can do it, so can I. Uh, what I will tell you is she will for sure tell me I did it first, so I'm a follower of her. I'll follow her anywhere. Implication number one, there's nothing more important than knowing God. There's nothing more important than knowing God. So fundamentally, when we're making a decision in life, one of the first questions we need to be wrestling with isn't, is this a good idea or a bad idea? It's, how does this decision help me know God? Does this get in the way of me knowing God or does it help me to know God? It's good to know. Implication number two. As a resident of the kingdom of God, my allegiance lies solely with him. That's it. I have no other place to put my affection, my attention, my allegiance, nothing. It all belongs to God. Implication number three. Trying to worship God and having idols is worse than just choosing one over the other. Like it's a miserable life to try to worship God and still hold on to things that I have expectations on. It's a miserable life. By the way, I know so many people who've walked away from the Lord because God didn't meet their expectations. Let me be really, really clear. He is God of the universe and I am not. God is under no obligation to meet any of my expectations. My obligation is to press into his presence, his power, his strength, his will, his way, so that I can go through those things in a way that brings honor and glory to him. And if you're like, well, wow, isn't God full of himself? Who else would he be full of? He's God. Choose. This is, this is the, the dividing line all the way through the Bible from slaves in Egypt to Joshua, right? All the way through the kings, the judges and the kings, um, all the way through the prophets, all the way up to Jesus. There's a dividing line. It's like, listen, you can't have the idols of your heart and still understand the presence of God. You can't. You can't do it. Implication number five. And I said this before, but I'm going to repeat it. God doesn't promise to deliver us from our hard circumstances. God promises to use our hard circumstances to deliver us from our idols. And I'm not saying that that's the only reason for suffering in the world. Suffering in the world is a complex issue. It has a lot in it. But what I can tell you is if we allow God to do his work in the midst of our difficult circumstances, then what we can do, what we can know is that God will deliver us from the idols in our hearts. 
I, I've been thinking about, um, you know, my, my nephew's wife. You guys I told the story about it a while back. Um, the, there's some amazing things going on. Like by God's absolute miracle, and I'm not even exaggerating, by a miracle of God, she's out of the hospital and home. Like her lungs were 0% functional. I'm not exaggerating. That's what the doctor said. They're 0% functional to being out of the hospital and home. Now that's the good news. On the flip side of that, she's got uh, severe chronic pain. Uh, she's, she can't walk across the room. Because of her pain, she's perpetually nauseous, so she can't eat enough to keep weight on, which makes her weaker. Like there's a lot of obstacles for her to overcome still. And so while we can say this, like, yay, we love the good, there's also still some really hard stuff in it. And I'm not saying that God's, the reason she's going through this is because she has idols in her heart. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is what it's caused me to wrestle with is in the midst of wanting so badly for her to be delivered and wanting her to be delivered in a way where everybody looks and goes, oh God, wow. Wow, look at what you did. Um, what does that say about my expectations on God and who he is? And so we're learning to be patient and to lean on the presence of God in difficult circumstances rather than to go, well, God, you're not doing what I want you to do, so I'm mad at you and I'm out. We're learning that discipline and it's transformational. Because God doesn't, God's desire for his interaction with us isn't that we get to go do really cool things for him. It's not that we get to go do really cool things with him. God's interaction with us is that we would know him. That's his desire. So if we just build our whole relationship about being in the presence of God rather than God, give me a mission or give me the strength to do this or God, help me with this situation or that thing, whatever, even though we can pray those things, there's nothing wrong with praying those things, but if that's the extent of our relationship with him, it's very transactional. That's not God's heart. God's heart for us is that we would know him, that we would step into a relationship with him that becomes as important to us as food. That's what Jesus says. His disciples were trying to get him to eat something. And he was like, I have food that you don't even know about. My food is to do the will of my father. Like he was so connected to God. I'm like, well, that was Jesus. I'm gonna submit that I think that was Jesus in his humanness, understanding what it means to be connected to God's presence. And we can get there. So as we think about communion, we take communion every week. If you're new with us, hold those elements. We'll take them all together in just a minute. I'm so excited not to hear plastic crinkling right now. Um, at the center of our faith is a savior who, in the very act of giving us access to a relationship with God, models how we should press into that relationship with God by sacrificing and laying his life down. This is our call. In the words of the great philosopher, the Mandalorian, this is the way. There's no other, there's no other way to get there. There's no other way. And so right now, as we prepare our hearts for communion, what I would ask you to do is take a minute and just sit with the Lord. So, okay, what are the idols in my heart? What are the idols? What are the things that I'm holding on to? What are the expectations that I have of God that maybe aren't fair? And what does God want you to do with that right now? Let's talk to the Lord a minute. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is given for you. So whenever you eat this bread, do it in remembrance of me. Now, 
And then in the same way, after the dinner, he took a cup and he said, this cup, this is the blood of the covenant which is shed for you. So whenever you drink this cup, do it in remembrance of me. Let's pray. God, give us courage as we look at the mirror of our soul that we wouldn't try to deflect or uh, think about someone else, point the finger somewhere else, but that we would just look at our own selves and be honest about the idols that we try to carry as we also try to worship you. Lord, give us the courage to lay those down, to mine those out and lay them down. God, thank you for your gentleness and your grace as we go through this journey. In Jesus' name, amen.